Okay, uh, hello. Uh, today we'll talk about this uh, important uh, German architect, Gottfried Böhm, uh, born in 1920. Uh, and let's uh, read a little bit about him. So Gottfried Böhm uh, was born uh, on the on the 23rd of January 1920, but he died on the 9th of June, and today is the 9th of June. 2021. So actually, he died uh, exactly two years ago, was a German architect and sculptor. His reputation is based on creating highly sculptural buildings made of concrete, steel, and glass. Böhm's first independent building was the Cologne Chapel, Madonna in the Rubble, interesting uh, interesting uh, name and uh, that building is also associated with Peter Zumthor. I read now integrated into Peter Zumthor's design of the Columba Museum renovation. The chapel was completed in 1949 where a medieval church once stood before it was destroyed during World War II. Böhm's most influential and recognized building is the Maria Königin des Friedens Pilgrimage Church in, I can't, I'm, I'm almost sure I, I don't pronounce well this name, Nebigis, Nebigis, in, I don't know German, which is uh, sad, but it's not the only thing I don't know. In 1986, he became the first German architect to be awarded the prestigious Pritzker Prize among the most recently completed construction projects involving uh, Gottfried Böhm are the Hans Otto Theater in Potsdam and the Cologne Central Mosque completed in 2018. So let's see some of his works, but before let's look at the man. I like very much his sweater uh, and I like his seriousness. Um, and it seems uh, God liked him too because uh, gave him 101 years of uh, living on this earth. Here he is with his uh, uh, siblings, with his brothers. Uh, he's the second one from the left. And, uh, <laughs> you know, it's amazing. It looks like, you know, they are all, uh, you know, uh, advanced in age. Anyway, so this is, uh, this was Gottfried Böhm. Uh, after he received the Pritzker Prize, uh, but I, he probably was uh, smiling even before, although the first picture we saw showed him. Uh, and this is a picture as a young man, and he, in my opinion, he was a handsome man. And uh, an interesting artist and architect. Some drawings by uh, Gottfried Böhm. Um, this is the, the church that he built, all concrete. I mean, it's a... It's, uh, it's a tour de force in concrete. Um, and uh, he has very nice uh, pencil drawings. You know, uh, section. And here he is uh, drawing something which was not built, but, uh, you know, it's still an interesting picture. The architect still drawing with, with a pencil or with a, you know, a, a pen with a with a lead. Uh, I like the fact that he was inspired by the Gothic, because usually modernism was not um, very fond of the Gothic. But him, and even more his his uh, his uh, father, because he came from uh, he was born from uh, you know in a family with uh, a lot of uh, architectural activity, and uh, uh, Dominicus Böhm, his father was a famous expressionist architect who built many churches. So I suggest to you, if you are interested, to um, uh, check him out. So it's not just Gottfried Böhm, but also Dominicus Böhm, his father who was truly a great, uh, a great uh, expressionist uh, architect who built mostly churches. This is the plan, of, but we are going to see that the, the, this work in, in, in detail uh, a little bit later. Now, this is the first important work he did, which is also connected with Peter Zumthor. As I said, 1947-1950, um, St. Columba in Cologne or Köln in Germany, where there was a, a Gothic church 
that was destroyed in the Second World War. In the back here, in the background, we see the, the, the spires of the uh, famous uh, uh, Cologne or Köln uh, Cathedral. But this one in the, in the foreground is what remained, as you can see, after the deadly bombings. Uh, I should have had more pictures, but I don't. 1962, 1969, the Bensberg City Hall, uh, another opus in concrete, uh, but we are going to we are going to to to, to see it uh, a little more in detail. Here you see the city hall is the the work in the foreground, all concrete, and we see the flash, which is uh, you know uh, itself some kind of an homage to the medieval um, silhouettes, not to speak, uh, not to say uh, medieval architecture. And we see here the way he integrated or tried to integrate uh, the old with the new. Although, in my opinion, in this work, the new is still a little bit rigid and predictable and even, if you want, a little bit commercial. But it's an office building. It's the city hall with its uh, bureaucratic uh, spaces, the offices. Uh, the most impressive part is the tower, I will say. But he was also a sculptor, and you can see that here. But I think the, the, the rest of the building on the right is a little bit uh, cold, in my opinion. And not because of the material he used, meaning concrete. Uh, what is this? A housing estate from 1965. Um, an interesting uh, housing complex, a lot of color, so the, the chromatic aspect is uh, seductive. And, uh, you know, he does this embroidered uh, metallic uh, treatment of the, of the balconies, which are very playful and, in my, ob in my opinion, very, very pleasant. Yes, also, yes, uh, concrete a lot uh, here as well. Uh, but uh, even where there is concrete, uh, uh, he sometimes uses color, like you see here. And I think it's done very imaginative, imaginatively. And, uh, you know, it, it, color and the variety of, uh, you know, uh, volumes, uh, the sculpturalness of the building makes a more humane, uh, you know, sensitive uh, building, even if it's in concrete. So, uh, housing complex, he built another one, and we are going to see that one as well. Even if he had, uh, you know, a robust, uh, um, one could almost say a brutalist kind of aesthetics, he indulged also in Baroque, uh, you know, interventions, like here. You know, this sinuousness uh, is uh, rather Baroque in spirit. Interesting architect, and uh, also you see, unafraid to, uh, you know, oppose uh, green to red, which are opposite colors in the in the wheel of colors. Access to the apartments from an exterior exterior corridor. Plants climbing on the on the on the on the, on the building. or painted, like you see. Now, I don't know if he did this uh, artistic intervention here, you know, to maybe he did, or maybe someone else did it later. But all in all, it's, it's a building that is not the usual block of flats. Exterior corridors that connect uh, the two uh, sides of the, of the complex. So, the sculpturalness of the building is a positive thing. And I, I would say that, um, you know, uh, it might be that architecture is not an inhabited sculpture, as Constantin Brincu said, but sculpturalness does help architecture. Uh, 
And this is from the 1960s. So, you know, uh, more than half a century uh, ago. Gottfried Böhm. Now we look at this um, uh, Catholic uh, <coughs> church, uh, work a little bit less known. Uh, it's not his most famous building, but uh, it's still architecture. And he has a very interesting uh, uh, glass work, but the roof is interesting as well. And you look at the, look at the glass work, if we can call it so. It's not really, it's almost no glass, but it's, it's uh, it's a very sculptural and plastically inciting treatment of the openings where one would expect to be just glass. A very appropriate for a church. And maybe not only for a church. I wish I had more pictures with this work because I think it deserves attention. I have to improve on the presentation. As I said, it's not a very long presentation. Now, Iglesia Youth Center Library in Cologne, uh, uh, it's, a, it's, a, it's a library for, for a church. And, and he works with the concrete and brick uh, quite well. I think some uh, green, some plants would have helped even further, you know, the buildings. If, 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 if plants would, would, were allowed to attack the walls. But that could still happen. Gottfried Böhm. A massive, uh, you know, sculptural uh, architecture with these uh, walls, almost like uh, fortress, fortress walls. You can tell that he was attempting the medieval, the, uh, as I call it, the medievalization of moder modernism. Now this is this is his well known, his best known work, Maria Königin des Friedens in uh, God. I can read that. Uh, this is the work. Uh, it's uh, it's uh, it's a very important. Um, uh, work that he did, very sculptural. I understood that uh, the concrete in time um, uh, needed uh, some, some work. Um, it, it became affected by the elements. But this, uh, you know, abstract uh, mountain of concrete is, I think, uh, metaphorically at least, uh, referring to, you know, uh, uh, to nature although it is an abstract in nature. It's, uh, you know, almost a uh, concrete uh, iceberg. So let's, uh, let's read a little about it because it, it has an interesting um, uh, history. Standing like a concrete mountain amid a wood, the jagged concrete volume of the Neviges Mariendom Cathedral of St. Mary of uh, this place, towers over its surroundings. Built on a popular pilgrimage site in Western Germany, the Mariendom is only the latest iteration of a monastery that has drawn countless visitors and pilgrims from across the world for centuries. Unlike its medieval and Baroque predecessors, however, the unabashedly modernist Mariendom reflects a significant shift in the outlook of its creators. A new way of thinking for both the people of post-war Germany and the wider Catholic Church. And it's very interesting that almost a blind man 
uh, advocated uh, uh, this, uh, this project in the competition that took place. I'll read about it. Pilgrims have been making their way to this town since the late 18th century with a church of the, of the uh, time first played host to an uh, Immaculata, a vener venerated copper engraving depicting the Immaculate Conception of the Virgin Mary. The site's popularity proved too great for the existing Baroque monastery, leading to the construction of an annex structure in the early 20th century. Even with this purpose-built structure, a spike in pilgrimage following the Second World War again saw the church at, uh, in this town significantly over its modest capacity. In 1960, it was decided that a new pilgrimage church would be built to cope with the influx of visitors. So this is, uh, this is the building. Uh, I, I, I was hoping uh, there is a more ample uh, text. Uh, I, I probably have some more text later. So this is the building. We will see the hill or the mountain on the left. We see the mountainous uh, concrete uh, uh, church and we see the houses uh, of this town. Uh, and um, let's uh, let's read more. With this goal in mind, the Archbishopic Bishopric of Köln, Cologne, organized an, an architectural competition to take place between 1963 and 1964, 60 years ago. The contest called for a church building with seats for 900 worshippers, with standing room for 3,000 more. Other required elements included two chapels, a confessional church, a sacristy, a bell tower, and other ancillary spaces. The winner, chosen by both the jury and particularly by Köln's Archbishop Joseph Frings, who was almost blind at the time, was a German architect named Gottfried Böhm. I love this, that an almost blind archbishop advocating this modern uh, architecture. Bravo to him. Well, we know this from uh, Greek uh, mythology, you know, that, uh, you know, the, the seer who, uh, uh, you know, uh, saw the truth behind the Trojan War was actually blind, Tiresias. So the blind actually sees more and better than the ones who have no problem at seeing. Interesting, no? And also in the movie, um, uh, the uh, how is it called by Fritz Lang? Uh, a great uh, expression is movie. The uh, uh, CTM, something like this, uh, searching is searching for its uh, murderer. The also the one who discovers the the murderer is a, is a blind man. <laughs> On all the others who were not blind couldn't do it, but the blind man does. In this case, the Archbishop Joseph Frings, who was almost blind at the time, was uh, he chose, and being in the position of being Köln's Archbishop, he he was very influential. So he succeeded. Very very nice. Maybe we need more blind people in the world. This was the man, <laughs> the Archbishop uh, Frings. Uh, he has glasses here, uh, certainly with a, some reason. I read very nice uh, things about this, uh, this gentleman. He was also uh, uh, an adversary of Nazis, Nazism, and uh, because he was a prestigious uh, church figure, he was, uh, you know, not uh, killed by the Nazis, but he, he advocated, uh, look here, his epi episcopal motto was pro hominibus constitutus, which in Latin means appointed for the people, appointed not by the people, but for the people, or both, appointed by the people, for the people. Not bad. Or maybe we should have also professors like this. Appointed by the students, for the students. That's what we need. Not professors appointed by professors, for the professors. We need professors appointed by the students for the students. And this is the church inside, not bad. 
So let's continue to read a, a little bit about it. <clears throat> In keeping <clears throat> with the Gottfried Böhm's particular style, the otherwise featureless gray expanses of concrete are punctuated with windows of brilliantly colored stained glass. Primarily red, blue, and green, the windows designed by Böhm himself depict in abstract a number of typical Marian themes, including a large red rose. For the Marian Capelle, uh, Böhm also created an elaborate composition centered around the, the ectus, ectis, the symbolic fish which represents Christ. Scattered throughout the church as sculptural works by other artists, including a marble column and altar designed by Elmar Hillebrand. Gottfried Böhm's own son, Marcus, was also responsible for the painting of the lower church. Uh, this was a family, and maybe still is, of, of, of architects. You know, everybody that was involved in that family with art and architecture. So this is the Red Rose, uh, where Gottfried Böhm uh, also, uh, you know, expressed himself. And I can only salute this, uh, you know, creative way of, uh, of uh, you know, uh, uh, acting in the field of uh, what we call uh, uh, sacred architecture. Uh, bravo to him and to his collaborators. Uh, despite being situated in a small, relatively remote community, the Marian Dome is monumental in scale. Böhm was a noted German expressionist, and, uh, you know, Böhm, uh, Dominicus Böhm who felt that sacred architecture, contemporary or otherwise, should elicit emotion in the viewer. Whether approaching by rail, road, or, uh, or maybe, maybe the reference is to Gottfried Böhm, but the German expressionist architect was actually his father, Dominicus Böhm. Anyway, uh, there are some expressionist elements um, to an extent even in uh, Gottfried Böhm's work, to an extent, not not very high, perhaps. Anyway, so uh, uh, should elicit emotion in the viewer. And, and yes, we need an architecture that does just that, elicit emotion in the viewer and user. Whether approaching by rail, road, or on foot, one can see a mountain-like peak of concrete from afar off. The path up to the church is lined, lined on one side by a wall, and by the offices and convent on the other, forming a sense of formal procession as pilgrims make the final leg uh, of the journey. And here it is. And this made me think a little bit, uh, you know, going by train towards Chartres from Paris and seeing from afar from the train the spires of the great uh, cathedral of Chartres. Is a very moving experience. So I suggest to you, if you go to France, if you go to Paris, please try to take the train to Chartres. It's just one hour away. And you will see the great cathedral of Chartres, maybe the most sublime uh, Gothic cathedral from afar. It's very, very beautiful. And also there are pilgrimages taking place with people walking, maybe all the way from Paris to Chartres. Very moving. Here we see these lower buildings, you know, pointing in the direction of the of the of the Marian Dome, the the church that uh, Gottfried Böhm uh, built. So, once constructed and consecrated in 1968, the Marian Dome became the second largest church in Germany, outdone only by the Gothic Cathedral in Köln itself. The concrete mass of the building, while giving the impression that it was impregnable, actually began to leak by the 1980s. At the time of construction, concrete's natural tendency to crack had evidently not been taken into account. Concrete patchwork done during the 1980s elicited criticism as the patches being of a different shade than the original material were seen as ruining the building's aesthetic purity. Under the supervision of the architect's son, Peter Böhm, however, a second effort to patch the concrete is expected to resolve the issue while maintaining the original outward appearance of the church 
for both pilgrims and architectural enthusiasts alike. So look at the look at the the ceiling here. It's incredible. It's incredible because it's 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 not it's 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 allowed uh, it's allowed to 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 escape uh, determinism or uh, you know uh, the will or the willfulness of the architect and it's 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 it's, uh, it's, it's an almost like an, an abstract work which welcomes even chaos uh, and uh, I would say that for that itself uh, we should appreciate this building mysterious windows darkness um, light. Um, yes, a lot of concrete, but look at this. It's it's like a like a medieval fortress. It's it's yet very modern, and yet somehow uh, uh, also uh, old. Uh, in the front, uh, in the in in, the, in in you know, is the the image of domesticity, the house. And then in the back, the austerity, the sculptural austerity of the house of God. Now, another kirche, another church in Saarbrücken, a very different kind of work. This one actually uh, kind of inspired or similar to the churches built by Dominicus Bern, his father. At first, I thought was actually by his father, and I, I, I am still somehow tempted to think that maybe I placed it wrongly here, that this cannot be the God, the church built by Gottfried Bern, but by Dominicus Bern. I have to double check, because looking at it again, I, 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 I am beginning to have some doubts that it's actually by Gottfried Bern. Or maybe it was built by his father, and he did some additional work here. I, I have to double check. Uh, this looks more like a, like a building by uh, Dominicus Berm, actually. I, I could be wrong. I, I have to double check. But I have the highest respect for Dominicus Berm as well. Because I like expressionist architecture. And uh, Dominicus Berm built some remarkable churches. Now, what is this? Another kirche, uh, another church. Uh, was it built? These are just the renderings. Yes, it was built, and uh, it's not. It's it's impressive as well. Uh, if concrete didn't pollute, it would have been even greater. But uh, we know now that it does. Maybe I'm most surely at that time um, uh, architects didn't care about pollution. But uh, today we have to be careful. But it, 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 the interior is impressive. I only hope it's not as cold inside like in uh, Saint Pierre de Firmini Ver by Le Corbusier, where I was freezing uh, in January in 2018. I think it was 2018, yes. As opposed to the, the other church that we looked at, uh, here he had to accommodate the connection with the old church, with the old building. Now, a library in Ulm, uh, also in Germany, uh, pyramid-like. I guess MDRDB inspired themselves when they created a, a library, also pyramidal, like like this one. This one is in Ulm, uh, an interesting uh, town in uh, in Germany, where there was also maybe still is a, a kind of a branch of the Bauhaus, and uh, a city hall designed by Richard Meyer, and so on. But this this library also is. Uh, you know, uh, unconventional in the sense that you see the buildings around it and uh, the library has uh, an architecture that is uh, uh, so very different. Too bad that too much glass was used and there without air conditioning, both humans and books would, uh, would feel, uh, uh, you know, rather dwarfed by, uh, 
inconveniences by, uh, you know, troubles with uh, either heat in the summer and cold in the winter. A look at the elevator is otherworldly, is science fiction, is an um, unidentified uh, flying object. So, you know, uh, Gottfried Böhm experimented. He didn't just work, you know, as, as uh, he often did actually for the churches, but for a library, he, uh, he worked differently. Uh, so the, the stair is spiraling around the tower of, with the with the elevator, and we saw some images of the of the of the towering. And there is an amphitheater outside, quite uh, useful now for people to sit there and maybe eat the, you know a sandwich or something and listen to someone playing the violin or talk about read poetry or who knows what. The only objection I would have if I am uh, allowed to express it is so much usage with glass. But glass was the is the you know the promised land of architecture. You know we we, we seem to be unable to imagine an architecture without being uh, seduced by the demagogy of glass. If I am to use the title of an article written by a uh, uh, an American um, uh, architect, uh, editor, uh, writer, theoretician, Andrea Kahn. Um, so this is this is another interesting uh, work by him from 1974 to 1980, where he tried to combine housing with an existing theater. So it's a hybrid uh, uh, architecture. Uh, and you know the existing uh, tower, uh, you know building uh, uh, on the left, and uh, his interventions on the right. Uh, we see exterior stairs and corridors, and you know there are shops at the bottom. So it, it's it's very alive, and it's alive because of the hybridity of the functions. And again, unafraid to use color. So here is the theater, and these these are the the apartments, the the housing uh, that he built, and they form uh, some kind of a you know uh, coherent uh, organism, architectural organism, but of a hybrid nature. And again, this hybridity, I think, is a positive thing. Now, what is this? Um, ah, yeah, it's it's. Uh, where is it built? I don't see it. I guess he worked again. You know, we see everybody's burn. So. Uh, Gottfried Böhm and uh, meet uh, with Elizabeth Böhm and Peter Böhm, 1991-1998. He was already, you know, uh, over 80, if not over 90. This is the building, but I don't know where it is. In Berlin, in Köln, I don't know where it is. Um, a commercial building, but it, it is still uh, animated and, uh, you know, interesting, enticing, sculptural. Gottfried Böhm. And we see the value of ornamentation, the value of decoration, the value of uh, the capriciousness of the artistic side that, uh, you know, uh, is a positive thing to be uh, part of the, of the architecture. Usually the corner, the intersection of a street, the corner is um, as a special status and he emphasizes this uh, special uh, status of the building in the corner by making it more dra dramatic and more uh, fragmented and more agitated even because yes there is the, is a, is a, 
is a special place where two sides of two streets meet. So it's, it's a place of conflict in a way, a negotiation. And being a commercial building and being a big city, I don't know, I don't know which city, unfortunately, and I apologize. I think it participates to the dynamic uh, street life uh, properly. Now, the Hans Otto Theater in Potsdam, we are approaching the end of the presentation, 1995-2006. So he died in 2021. So he, you know, he was 85 years old or something like this at that time. Around that time, around that age, uh, Frank Lloyd Wright built the Guggenheim Museum. At this age, uh, Gottfried Böhm built this theater in Potsdam after the reunification of the two Germanies, because Potsdam was part of the, the democratic East Germany. But now, in 2006, was part of Germany. I'm not so sure about this thin, um, you know, uh, roof uh, uh, coverings. Uh, I, I don't know. I mean, they, they do express the lyricism, the exaltation of music, of art, of theater, uh, but somehow, and, and not just through the form, but also through color, uh, somehow they seem too predictably uh, uh, you know, uh, situated in a dialectical relationship with the glass walls, and you just have the dialectics without some kind of a negotiation between them. It's a little bit, uh, uh, I would say, a little bit uh, questionable, but uh, it's still an interesting work. It's still a, a work which, uh, especially in this picture, looks uh, inviting. And uh, if that glass was a little bit more. Uh, uh, you know, uh, creatively used, uh, it would have been even better, I think. Sorry, sorry about the alami. But art in its essence is exaltation. And, 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 and those red uh, uh, canopies of the roof uh, represent this, you know, the, the fire of, uh, of, of art, the exaltation of art. art. Uh, this is a church. Uh, and this is the last work I, I show, I think, in this uh, rather short presentation. Here we see again the medievalization of the modern or the medievalization of modernity. Maybe a little bit too explicitly, but it's still an interesting uh, work. Gottfried Böhm, the first architect to receive the Pritzker Prize, and until now, the only one. And this is a book that was published on him. There are many other books, um, uh, you know, with the theater in, in Potsdam that we, we, we just saw. And the exaltation of the roof that I mentioned. So let's uh, wish well. No, today was not his birthday but the day when he died. So thank you for being here today and let's uh, talk a little bit about this work. Thank you. <laughs>